I'm a feminist, but today my good friend Elizabeth Day, who you may know from Elizabeth Day's How to Fail, made a video for Instagram in which she admitted she had never watched a single episode of Sex and the City and felt that she needed to confess that because they are rebooting it, son Samantha. And she said in her video, which I responded to in her DMs, I'm so sorry if I've misled some of you into thinking I've watched it because I've watched the movies and I've just acted like I've watched it because it's one of those things that everyone's watched so I sort of think I know what it is. I am so sorry if I've misled you into thinking that I've watched it, to which I replied, Elizabeth Day, you give the impression you've watched it because you've got shiny hair and a symmetrical face and you throw book launches. Your whole vibe is a lie. <gasps> now, which she loved. But then I offered... <laughs> Then I offered, I'm a feminist, but then I offered to curate key important episodes for her so she could sort of follow, so she didn't have to binge the whole thing. This is a lot. Yeah, this is nice. That's good friending, actually, Debs. Mm -hmm. I had, um, it sounds terrible, but I did secretly enjoy it. Years ago, I had a partner who, to get me into Star Trek, and it worked, did me a very specific and unique self-curated Klingon story arc. Very nice. Do something like that with her. I'm not sure there's enough plot in Sex and the City for you to manage it, but good luck. Good, you can have a go. What you need to know is Big, Aiden, Berger, the Russian, <sighs> Big. Sorry, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> um, but that's the trajectory. What you need is the key episodes, like A Woman's Right to Shoes, that kind of thing. You need yeah. those funky taste okay. funky. You need that. I, I mean, I'm a feminist, but we have spoken about Sex and the City now for more than a minute. I'm... Um, Trapped in a house with my five-year-old, who's a uh, middle-class white man, and he's already sexist. And the latest evidence was probably the most on-the-nose sexism he's done. I do not know where it came from. Initially, it started sort of quite abstract, quite standard five-year-old, almost borderline cute. Initially, he was going, sniffing at my face. This happens quite a lot. And then he went... You smell of carrots. Hadn't had a carrot. Don't know where that came from. I had another carrot for days, I have to confess. So I, I just sort of went, all oh, right, like that. And he went, ugh, women these days. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He actually said women these days. Ugh, well, women these days. Is he in a 1970s British sitcom? Later, he ruined it by going, ugh, cats these days. Uh. About one of the cats smelling as probably carrots. But, yeah, it was the... Where has he got that actual phrase from? Wow. Ugh, groups of people these days. These that days. These yeah, are, these these are the only days, days. He's, he's had. He's had, no, I haven't yeah. many more days. He's only had about 15 days. I don't know what he... Women have been awful in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I'm a feminist, but I was extremely amused by our friend Dan Tetzel's post that went like this. If the first scene of the new Sex in the City isn't them leaving Samantha's nursing home, discussing how sad it is that all she does now is wet herself and rub her bits against the counterpane, then what's the point of celebrity feuds? <laughs> oh, they could do that. I think they're going to start with a yeah. funeral. That's what uh, I think. I think yeah, they're going to kill her off. Makes sense. Because she's made it very it? clear she's not coming back. Like she's left she's up the post where she's angry with Sarah Jessica Parker. I mean, yeah. Kim Cattrall, not Samantha. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, but I think they're going to kill her off. But the only other thing they could do is have her moved abroad and then occasionally get messages from her. But I just think they're going to want to. They're going to want to move yeah. on, aren't they? I think they're going. I wonder kill if it will be like Harold in Neighbours. And then um, <laughs> when she runs out of money, she'll come back yeah, out of the She ocean. runs out of money, she will re-emerge from the sea. <laughs> I think Identical. she's done a successful show, and I think I think the rift is yeah. too deep. Too deep. It's disappointing because I like to think of them as friends in real life, but I can't because they're not. Yeah. I'm a feminist, but the other day I went to the tip all by myself. And um to brag. I took in <laughs> I'd taken some um some rotten old garden chairs that have been sort of left in my backyard for a long time and I um, carried them through the house and they dripped a foul brown liquid all over the floor all over the carpet Oof. through the house 
all over me. It went through my jumper and I could feel the whatever the brown stinking liquid rust water was mm. gone through the jumper, through the T-shirt, onto my tummy skin. Ooh. And it was all on my hands. And um, I wept. Because <laughs> I'd got a bit mucky. Oh, uh, I can understand that, actually. Really? I think I would cry. And also... What did I expect? I was bringing a rotten chair through my house. It's not very clear what you expected, but no. I think it's all right if you are in tier 72, as we are. Yeah. If you're listening internationally, in Britain we have tiers to say how little you can leave the house. Tier one is the best, but no one's in it. Also, the trip to the tip, which is like a recycling and refuse area you go to and book a spot. That was our big adventure. My son had uh, yeah. never been that's, to a tip that's before. A reason to leave the house. That's it. I used to love going Lost. to the tip when I was a kid because in the eighties and nineties you'd be allowed to handle huge shards of broken electrical equipment mm. and glass and smash them in the bottle bin. It was so fun. Um, but obviously it's a modern time. So my son's got. I got him so up like about this big adventure to the tip, and we were both saying, "Oh, you know, we're going to love it. We loved the tip when we were a kid." First things first, he gets in the car. His mum's crying, covered in liquid brown, and then when we get there. There's a sign saying your kids aren't allowed out of the car. We like them <gasps> safe and alive now. Oh. Yeah. We betrayed it. I let him carry a small plastic item up two steps and we immediately were bollocked. Yeah. 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 I nearly cried again because I hate being told off so much. I am a feminist, but I am secretly amused that every single week that we have a new guest, almost invariably... Their tech doesn't work and is sorted out by a husband, boyfriend, or some male human in their bubble every <laughs> single time. And this week, it's no exception <laughs> because... It wasn't my five-year-old son. It wasn't me. Listen, I wouldn't be surprised. That's going to happen one week. He's going to come mm. in and go, oh, women these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you got a final line of feminist part? Yeah, Go it's on. a good one. I don't know if it's a good I'm a feminist but, but it's a story that since it happened, I thought about what maybe once a day at the absolute minimum and had a real chuckle. Um, so I've, over the course of the last year or so, since my son's been of a sort of more sentient age than just a sort of giant, strong baby, like a borderline person, I've been obviously trying to instill beautiful values. I'm a feminist but despite a year of me saying to my son things about the glorious diversity of bodies, being a brilliant, beautiful, healthy, magical, half none of his business type thing. Yeah. And that has included a lot of talk, in fairness, about size. He's like, you know, even at five years old, he'll be like, oh, at school they call me chubster or whatever you know and you'll be like okay well you know and he'll be like I want to honk your tummy like you just walk past give your tummy a honk like, ah, 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 ah. you've got a fat tummy ah, ah, ah. and I'm so used to it that I just be like yeah and that's good and that is good and he'll be like yeah and he's been so good about this uh, and sort of seemingly really listened it backfired a few months ago when we were into here too I met a friend at a, a beach an hour or so from my house for a winter swim and walk and fish and chips on the beach. And um, it was amazing. And we would freeze in and had these lovely fish and chips. And my son sort of ran off over the over a breakwater and onto the next bit. You could still see him. And it, it, it came back and it you see his hands. He's ready to pop, pop over the um over the breakwater at us. And we we're, we're in our cozies, it's it's the winter, and he jumps up and goes, Hey, fat ladies! <laughs> and, um, oh. <laughs> oh, you know, oh, ho, ho, ho. that's still spicy, that is. I struggled to entirely consume the compliment with relish. I mean, the thing is... It was, it was one of those where, luckily, luckily my friend was like... <laughs> like, luckily she cracked up because I was like, oh, oh, shit, oh, no. And you can't tell him off because I've been like, it's great, it's fine to be fat, it's good to be fat, just be who you're going to be, you know. But that means he's going to be like, hey, fat lady. You know, oh, oh. What I really love about that, Jess, though, is for him... That is a compliment. Like the way he's yeah. presented that, he's not gone, you're fat. He's gone, 
hey fat ladies like yeah. it's like like he's going yeah let's rumba like you know he's got that <laughs> I don't think that he's gonna I don't know that it's safe for him to shout that at people it that isn't not, it isn't because the, in the real world lots no. of people would still just cry no if in the real world it absolutely isn't okay but <laughs> I love that his generation <laughs> is gonna change it because wow let's hope yeah yeah oh listen <laughs> I'm not saying I want to be his mother in that moment I'm not no. saying I want to be his mother but I do love that for him it's a celebration because I mm. think that's the only way the world's going to change this next generation you say that Debs I think he knew he was being a shit <laughs> <laughs> From a variety of bedrooms and kitchens via Zoom, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Jessica Foster Key, and our very special guest, Yasmin Benoit, talking about being overlooked. Woo! Yeah! Ah, yeah! Woo! Oh, yeah. <laughs> This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Jessica Foster Q, and we're talking about being overlooked. Yes, please. Uh, how are you, Jessica Foster Q? I don't want to overlook your mental health and general state before we begin. <laughs> how are you? Yeah, I'm all right, thanks. How are you? Uh, well, I'm in tier four, mm. as I assume you are. Yeah, I thought I was in a full lockdown. Tier yeah. five. I think it's five now, actually. I think it's gone up. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, my lifestyle hasn't changed between four and five drastically. I hasn't just it? didn't, I wasn't going out. I'm still not I'm going out. Not now. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's. I think it's the time of self discovery. In the last five minutes, I've wanking. learned. No, Deborah. <laughs> Sorry. Disgusting. It was, just the way, it was just the way you said it. You're, s- honestly, grow up. I'm so um, sorry. I've regressed. Is that, very- is that because earlier I tried to, to make it sound like there's more of us to clap with both my hands and my legs, and that did sound rude? Was it <laughs> I that? Mean, that's given you a dirty thought. Everything you that look- you say sounds rude. I what think. I was going to say Sorry. is I've discovered in the last five minutes, you can eat so much pitta bread so fast, you get hiccups. Ooh. Yeah, I thought it was just fizzy drinks, but actually, if you eat them at an at impressive enough pace... Yeah, mm. you aerate them. Right. And, um, I got little hiccups now from a pit. Oh, that has actually happened yeah. to me. Has it? <laughs> yes. It was brioche rolls. So. so you're hearing the voice now of our guest today, our guest, the wonderful Yasmin Benoit. And also, just in case she wants to chip in, given we've got an audience, we do accept heckles from our guests, our <laughs> musical guest, uh, Zosie's here too. Hey, Zosie. Hiya. So how are you in tier five, tier 12, whatever the fuck we're in now? I think we're in a tier now that if you deny COVID exists, a fairy gets it and dies. Right. (laughs) I never liked Tinkerbell anyway, but but I'm not going to do that. Wow. Um, That's a real I'm a feminist butt, Yasmin, if I'm completely (laughs) honest with you. That's a real I'm a feminist butt, that you never liked Tinkerbell. She was like my least favorite character in that movie. I was sick of her. I was like, don't believe in fairies. Let her die. I don't like her. <laughs> wow. But did Amazing. you like Peter Pan and Captain Hook? Because I see a problem with your feminism right there. Um, You know what? I actually liked the sequel. I liked Wendy's daughter who punched Peter in the face when like they first met. I liked her. Brought it right uh, back with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was like, she understands the weirdness of the situation. So I was into yeah. the sequel. But yeah, I mean, we've been in like, I'm in Reading, so we've been in lockdown like throughout December, so things haven't really changed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've only been outside like once in this whole year so far. Wow. (laughs) There's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go. I don't think I've been out at all this year. I've got an exercise bike and I'm just not going out. But do you know what? When I was a little girl... I used to have dreams that I was smoking because that was my fear that other kids at school sometimes would have a cheeky cigarette behind a bike shed. And I thought that was like, like one day, what if I did, what if I crossed that terrible Rubicon? So I would wake up going, I did it in my dream. Now, then when I became a Jehovah's Witness, those dreams shifted from smoking to talking to a disfellowshipped person because there was a shunning system. So if one of your mates did the wrong thing in inverted commas or decided to leave or got found out because they snogged a boy and weren't repentant or something. I mean, they probably had to do more than snog, but, you know, whatever. They weren't repentant. How much more? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I reckon you could get disfellowship for second base, if I'm completely honest. Okay. If you second based it and the elders decided, like you said, you repented, but the elders thought you weren't, whatever. Right. A very patriarchal system. Then you could get disfellowship. And my mates would always get disfellowship because they were the fun ones. And so I used to dream, I used to have these nightmares that I'd seen my friend and instead of just walking past them and cutting them dead and ghosting them like you were meant to, that I'd talk to them and I'd wake up and go, oh, I've done it. I've talked to a disfellowship person. I'm going to get disfellowship now. Oh. Now, when I left the Jehovah's Witnesses, those dreams stopped because that is not okay. That's not good. But the last three nights in a row, I've had a dream that I'm in a public place. I realize I have no mask on. I'm talking to someone with no mask on. I'm trying to find a mask. I'm trying to find them a mask. I can't. More people come. More people are coming. I am surrounded by COVIDity and yeah. I can't control it. And I'm like, I've done it now. I've talked to someone without a mask on. That is how tier five I am right now. I'm That's having fun. nightmares. I really hack that. obvious anxiety dreams. Me too. I desperately wish mine were more creative. They're always, it's always really obvious what they're about. But at least like you haven't woken up going... I wonder why I have anxiety about that thing. At least it's like, it's a, you've got a very great, big, objective reason to be being very worried about the thing. If it makes you feel better, Debs, back before we were in any big, juicy tiers, back when we were in like tier one, tier two, we we're really kind of, is there even a tier, level tier? I witnessed several parents in my kids' school playground talking to teachers and um, just to be just to be heard a bit more clearly, pulling the mask down to have a... A close-up, clear, just oh, to make sure no. I'm being heard. Oh, my really God. What's the point fun. of the mask? I know, it joyful to, to watch. Too, that they, I've seen them pull it down to sneeze, and I'm like, this is the point of the mask. Yeah. <laughs> do not do that. Why would you do that? They've just misunderstood the whole point of the mask. So we're talking about being overlooked. Yeah. Do you ever feel overlooked? Yeah, definitely. Less so, I think, the older I get. And it's hard, isn't it, to work out where the boundaries lie of, am I just less overlooked now? Almost definitely. Because you just get sort of a bit more authority with age. But also where the boundaries lie between that and how much less fucks I give if I'm mm. looked over or under. Like, I, you know, there's got to be a bit of both happening there, I imagine. Um, but historically, loads. Do you have more strategies now, if you're feeling overlooked, to step forward like a feminist mm. and go, excuse me, I'm being overlooked here? Well, that's interesting. I don't know. So I suppose it's a mixture, you know, of a bit of that and also a bit of the not caring. I think there's power in... Uh, the, not caring makes it sound like too aloof. Perhaps put better like this. Like if you've put yourself forward for something, which... I suppose in our work you do all the time, every time you pitch anything, every time, you know, you're paid to write something, but there's no guarantee it will be made. Every time there's an award that it would be nice to win, whatever. You are putting it in the world, literally or philosophically in how you talk and how you are, that you're like, hello, here I am. I'd like this thing, but I now go, I'd like this thing. Here's me saying that. Here's my offering. And then that's it then. It's gone into the ether. I have learned to really have let that go. Lovely if you hear back. Otherwise, whatever, on to the next thing. Enjoy the offering mm. to the world. Maybe that's not great feminism. No, I think it's very feminism. I <laughs> Because it's not me going, hey, excuse me, did you get my application? Is it? It's me going, ah, well, fuck it. Apply for something else. But there's something very feminist about letting go and not demanding that the power structures that are not necessarily designed for you all the time, mm -hmm. uh, not letting them undermine your happiness. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Like I think actually not letting them get under your skin because if you can't mm. control the outcome, and this is probably you're learning to be happy there. What you're doing is going, I can't control the outcome. Yeah. So me angsting about the outcome has never paid off before. It's just given me anxiety and I still didn't hear back or didn't get the result that I wanted. So you've learnt, don't let the patriarchy get you down, basically. Don't let the yeah. bastards grind you down. Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, and I think, you know, I put an enormous amount of work into something recently and then found out that's the end of one road for it and was like, I thought I'd be absolutely devastated. And I was like, oh, well. I think historically, you know, even five years ago, if I'd got that far with something and then known it wasn't going any further, I mean, historically, that's the reason why I never fi even finished any treatments. 
let alone whole pilots or anything like long narrative writing. It does help that we're in a pandemic and it's the only work we've got. But but it does make me go, okay, write something else, write something better. It takes a lot of confidence to go, okay, I'll write something else rather than going, oh, what's the point? I'm obviously not good enough. But also there takes a bit of humility to go, well, write something better then. There's all, you can always do something better. So it's a mixture of those things as ever. But also acknowledging that it might not be about better, it might be about else. Yeah, and time and space. And like you said, if you can't control it, if you can avoid being crushed by the things you can't control, brilliant. I've developed a new theory this week that I want to run by you, Jess. Yes, please. Come on. I don't like uh, men uh, men do this, women do this, because obviously that isn't true. And what about non-binary people and blah? But there are some trends. And one of those is I notice that often when I'm with my female friends, there will be a lot of analysis So you know that thing of women going, what do you think that text message means? Like when he says, come over later, does he mean that? Or like, it's it's not got any kisses at the end. If you want, or come over later if you want. Does he mean like, oh, if you want? Or does he really mean if you want? And then you sit there analysing what if you want means, rather than just, you know, or listening to somebody's voice message or or analysing what this email means from their boss or whatever. And I really noticed that as a trend that I don't find, especially straight men doing that, or finding that frustrating, that process, going, well, yeah. well you know, it, I don't want to sit there and listen to your voice message five times. It's If, if he said, if you want, I see he means if you want. Like, that, that's, that's clear. Um, yeah. And they're not looking for a new ones. This is my new theory about this. I think that the reason women as a trend are more analytical is because historically we have not had the power. And if you don't have the power, if you have the power, you could just – intuitively make a decision and get on with your day. You don't have to analyze why you've done it. If you don't Mm. have the power, what you need to work out is that person with the power, why do they do what they do and what do they mean when they say so that you can influence or manipulate the outcome because you cannot control the outcome. And that's why women are so good at analyzing. Maybe. And sometimes overanalyze because we have proximity to power and the less proximity we have to power, the less relevant it is because I can't influence them anyway. So you'll find some people in society who say, for example, have no proximity to power or feel they have no proximity to power in the government. So just like, fuck it, they're all the same. They're all as bad as each other. And they don't try and influence the outcome because they think there's no way of influencing the outcome and then they become disinterested, even though they may be the people that suffer the most from Priti Patel's legislation. Because it's like, I can't help. I can't do anything about it. The closer you are to power... Without having it, the more you become analytical. How can I shift it? How can I, how can I make him do what I want him to do? That's really interesting. Good work. I mean, yeah, maybe, Debs. I'm looking for a categorical, that is correct or that isn't correct, Jessica Hostick. I am not qualified. I'm looking to, for you I'm to not just act like you are. Somebody who, okay, I was going to say, I do not have a sideline in checking the legal boundaries of people's theories on podcasts. <laughs> but I do have a sideline in two to three acting jobs a year in normal times, maximum of three scenes, two lines. So I am prepared to do a bit of acting now. Ready? Mm. Oh, my God. I mean, that's absolutely, that's 100% true. I can't believe it. Thank you. I can't Thank believe this is the first time I've ever heard it, Deb. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you. <laughs> Get that down in paper. Get that down. No, not in paper. It's 2020. Type, type that in. Um, voice dictate that into a saved thing on a cloud. I will. I'm going yeah. to do that. Please welcome to the microphone, the incredible Jessica Foster Q. Woo. That's nice. That's nice. I um, I think I've got off pretty lightly in the old being overlooked terms. I think, I mean, it's ironic, but if I am asked to delve deep and think about being overlooked, then the most sort of poignant times were as a teenager where I just, unlike our amazing guest today, desperately wanted to get laid. Like I just <laughs> wanted everyone to fancy me and very few people did. Mm. And I, I had, you know, where people say, oh, I set the bar quite low. I don't think I had a bar. <laughs> like, I think I was p- pretty open book um, in all the ways. Um, so that was like, I remember that. I do. That was my first sort of wave of it. I remember being like, right, well, no one fancies me. And that feels like shit. But I mean, God, that was just, that's like wild hormones. There's no foresight in that. There's no 
oh, really, it's such a brief reality, those awful, tricky teenage years, bobbing around the edge of a disco. Uh, my favourite example, really, of being overlooked is actually as a comedian, because there's some really good, univer- almost universal experiences of comedians who've played stereotypical comedian club gigs. So what you'll have is a, an MC and three, maybe four acts doing a mixture of 20 or 10 minutes is each. And uh, it seems to me that this has happened to almost all comedians, that you will, um, first of all, the MC... If you MC a lot, you are guaranteed to have had an audience member assume that you weren't actually one of the acts mm. and come up to you and be like, you were good. You should try doing stand-up. <laughs> You're like, excuse me, pardon? Uh, what did you think I was? Like an intermittent TED talk? <laughs> just, I think they just drafted in someone from security or a teaching agency just to, talk, just to make sure everybody was up to date with the sort of physical admin between the actual comedy and the irony is the MC I would say arguably has the hardest job if you've gone to watch a comedy night the MC will be the only person usually genuinely improvising Mm -hmm. almost throughout they'll be the only person comedian stuck yes comedian stuck there all night so they can't double up or triple up with other gigs they're there that's their one fee for the whole night and they're kind of morally responsible for the whole night if one of the other people up on stage decides they're not having a nice time and walks off the comedian has to come on the MC has to fill until the next break or whatever like it's such a huge job the i oh god it's, it's brutal to assume but, but that they're, they're not a comedian but i hear that yeah hear that. it's like kind of covid denial level of <laughs> lack of foresight of what's in completely in what front do of you, you think? Um, um, but the other one in terms of overlooked as a comedian that i feel like we've all had is when you've done a gig this is regardless of how it's gone say it's gone absolutely fine if not good, you're standing with another comedian after the gig and an audience member comes up and says to the other comedian, you were amazing. And you're just standing there while this comedian, and it's horrible for the comedian as well that's getting the compliments because they know that you're there not getting any compliments. (laughs) And and the only way that this gets levelled up, and sometimes it does, is when that kind, well-intended audience says, oh my God, you're amazing, even though it's comedian. And then they say... You were the best by miles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And you're like, I'm, I'm yeah. right here. <laughs> In preparation for our show tonight, Debs had like ranted and rambled and really enjoyed what I've written, like silly pages of notes on this, of examples of times that that's happened and that. And then I thought, oh, God, actually, it's a guilty feminist. I probably should have talked about hashtag by invisibility, but I didn't because I just really miss gigging. Mm. And no one's not seeing my bi-pan whatever sexuality at the moment because no one's seeing me anyway. No, sexuality is so 2019. I mean, if I'm honest now, I mean, I'm not saying, listen, there's not a lot going on behind closed doors, but the doors are very firmly closed. So if you are not behind they it are. with someone you fancy, that's too late. That train has left the station. Um, tell me the examples on your that you've scribbled on the thing. Every now and again, do you have an interaction that sticks a little thorn in your heart? Yeah. Like, even when it was a million years ago in the context of your career, your life, your confidence, your personality, your voice, it's still there. <laughs> like, and it's like, just not so... I am... Um, one of the first sort of brave things I ever did is before I... St- I think it was before I started doing stand-up. No, I was maybe a year in. I wrote a whole sketch show with bits of stand-up in it called Jessica Foster Q and Friends, which was quite a big lean in yeah. sort of perhaps overly confident thing Sounds to like do Victoria a year into being friends. a stand-up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I wrote parts for a few of my very talented friends, including my then boyfriend and um, a producer from Tiger Aspect, who are big deal. And at the time, I'd never had a producer come from a proper production company. Mm. It was a woman. She came... And I was so excited that she'd come. We had this show. There were sketches and bits of stand-up. It's chaos. But my God, like, it was at the Canal Cafe. It couldn't have gone better. Like, it was... People were really losing their shit laughing all the way through it. An hour, bosh, gone. Felt like five minutes done. I was in the bar afterwards. And um, she came over and was said, Toby, to my then boyfriend, you were amazing. You were absolutely amazing. I, I can't... Like, you did so well with that. Like, and, and she was just sort of... And I was stood right there and I said, oh, thank you so much for coming. And she was like, "Mm." and then carried on talking to him. And and then, and this is how pathetic I was. I went, "Um, can I get you guys a drink? And she went, no, thanks. I'm talking to Toby. And I said, "Um, I am. I wrote that. (laughs) Which is so pathetic. And she went, yeah, Toby was really good. It was like a 
fuck you. Mm-hmm. And I look back on that and it's like never, the thorn has never come out. She like doubled down on it. Like there was no pleasantries, mm-hmm. there's no social niceties. And I genuinely look back like as a, you know, serious feminist now and go, was it because he's a man and women aren't funny and blah, blah, blah? Or was it because what I'd written was probably quite dog shit? And I think it's probably going to be a bit of both. There's got to be a bit of both there. But also, in a, in a way, now I look back on it and go, hats off to her for having the lack of bullshit about her that she was like, no, no, I won't be coaxed into being nice to you. Like, I hated that. I don't know about that. I don't think that's useful. I think that what you can do is say to somebody... The costumes were good. No, I think you can say, really well done for getting this together. I know how much work it takes and I really look forward to seeing your evolution. Yeah, I mean, that's the borderline patronising, isn't it? But people do that in interviews all the time. But you could, you could be like, oh my God, there's so much potential in those characters. You're so right. There's so many tactful ways of saying it's not there yet. But saying... Or it wasn't for me. Yeah, but also, but keep going. Because I want to see you... She'd like me to have stopped. (laughs) (laughs) I feel I've been overlooked loads of times. During Edinburgh, I'm very sensitive to it, to the Edinburgh, not, not just Edinburgh the city, because uh, I'm aware comedians talk about Edinburgh like it's Brigadoon, but in the Edinburgh Festival, in Performers Bars, I actually have always wanted to start a new Performers Bar called Shoulder Surfing. That You specifically go in there to, to find someone more famous than you're talking to or more influential than you're talking to. That's the whole deal. Wow. So you get go that in, out of your system there. Somebody. Just get it out of your system there and then move on and behave like oh. a nice human that's not a turd when you're in all the other bars. A man once, who I love, oh, no. adore, comedian once, I passed him. He was chatting to somebody. Oh. And I just went, hi, how are you doing? And both of them turned and incorporated me into the conversation and then she said, I've got to go. I've got to run to a show. I've got to see someone's show. And off she went. And he went, she was from the BBC. You shouldn't have interrupted us. And I was like, I didn't know. I was just saying hi. But it would have been very weird for me to walk past him and not say hi. And, I mean, he oh, could have always God. said, oh, just having a chat. We'll get, I'll, let's have a drink later. But she incorporated, she also had to go. But he was in such a state of anxiety around oh, doing something for the BBC. Grim. And I, I remember feeling really crushed by it because I thought, oh, what are the social cues? Mm. I should not talk to anyone else in case they're talking to someone from the BBC ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I always oh. remember another friend of mine telling me a story about how there was a guy who only used to want to talk to important people during the Edinburgh Comedy Festival. And a comedian came up who was more successful than him. So he was like talking and talking to this comedian and trying to ingratiate himself and absolutely ignored this comedian's girlfriend. Absolutely Mm. ignored her. And when they left, this friend of mine turned to him and said, you know, she works for the BBC in the comedy department. And he went, oh, damn, I should have talked to her. And she said, okay, I'm going to tell you something else now. She doesn't, but do you get my point? what you just did. And he went, yeah, okay. I, oh, I see what you, yeah. You should be nice to everyone in case they work for the BBC. <laughs> yeah, that was his takeaway. His oh, takeaway no. was not just be nice to everyone because they're a human being. She was trying to wake oh, him up to, oh, oh, now you want to talk to her, but she's not an important person unless she works for the BBC or is a comedian. Oh, is that what you're no. saying? And that yeah. was his takeaway was, oh, I see. My life lesson is be nice to everyone in case they work for the BBC. Yeah, True story. in case they can get you something. Just be pleasant to everyone in case they've got something to give you. Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah. We're all stuck inside, but we're doing what we can to bring you as much Guilty Feminist goodness as possible. I'm also doing another series of Skills Booster webinars. We got such great feedback from these at the end of last year, but some people said the afternoon time wasn't great for them. So I'm doing the same three topics, but at 8.30 p.m. in the evening. So you could join me after you've got home from work or put the kids to bed or walked the dog. And if you watched last time, do feel free to watch again. The topics are the same, but I always think of new things to say and new ways to say them. And people always ask different questions. We're starting Wednesday, 17th of Feb with Include Yourself and Include Others. And you can get tickets by going to guiltyfeminist.com or by clicking the link in the show notes. Lastly, thank you so much to everyone who has signed up to support us on Patreon. We really couldn't keep the podcast going without your support. No exaggeration. We're doing regular monthly Zoom hangouts where you can ask me questions, hear what's going on in my life. So to be part of that, go now to patreon.com slash guiltyfeminist and sign up.
I know the pandemic has hit a lot of people very hard, but if you're not already contributing and it's possible for you to show your support, then every penny really does count. And if you can't help us financially, why not spread the word? We love it when you listeners find the podcast. So if you could write about it, tweet about it, make an Instagram story with a little recording, or just tell someone you know about it, that would be a great help. Thanks to everyone who's listening to this. Guilty Feminist listeners are the best in the world, and we do love you all. And now back to the podcast. Our guest today is a fashion model, writer, activist, and master's graduate. At 18, she began modeling with the goal of diversifying the fashion industry and became one of the UK's most prominent black alternative models. In late 2017, she publicly came out as aromantic, asexual, and became an unlikely face for those communities. She focuses on raising awareness for asexuality and aromanticism and dispelling misconceptions about the identities. Please welcome Yasmin Benoit! Hi! (laughs) Welcome. I am so fascinated, and I'm really glad that I've met you on a podcast where I'm allowed to ask loads of questions and not at a dinner party where I'd feel it was rude. Uh, so, um, So Yasmin, firstly, you are a black alternative model. You're one of the most prominent black alternative models. Can you describe what an alternative model is? It's kind of like the darker kind of fashion, you know, kind of like the stuff, if you're British, that you'd find in Camden. I've modeled for quite a few of those Mm -hmm. brands before, kind of like Killstar, Dolls Kill, like that kind of vibe rather than like H&M kind of vibes. Got it. (laughs) I absolutely have it. So you do not model for Next because you are too cool. I mean, I wouldn't be against it. I'm sure they pay well, but I Next tend you're to listening, get more. Yasmin is open. <laughs> you look like a model. To be honest with you, you look. The reason I'm asking why you're an alternative model is you look like a model. I don't. I don't know what's. But I. I understand yeah. your vibe. Is you like what you're wearing is very hip and cool, but you do look like, in a very real way, a model. Just the words hip and cool have made you seem very hip and cool. Deb. I am hip and cool, Jessica Vostokou. So shut up. I'm also okay. groovy. <laughs> I'm, and I'm down with the kids. Um, uh, so, so you look like a model because you are a model. So let's. That's that's number one. Now, models are often, in truth, sexualized. We know that we we project all sorts of things onto models. That's the whole gig with models. In a way, it's first of all to make the clothes look attractive and desirable. What they do is they show me somebody as beautiful as you in the clothes, and I think. If I bought that dress, I'd look like Yasmin Benoit. Now, in reality, Yasmin, can I tell you, when it arrives, I have never do. I don't look like you in it. I just look like me in that dress. And that is a disappointment. However, 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 uh, sometimes the advertising industry uses models in a sort of, you know, sexualized way, that kind of thing. So this is really interesting that you are an activist for aromaticism and asexuality. Can you please talk us through that? Well, being asexual means experiencing little to low levels of sexual attraction. Um, I kind of phrase it as being the sexual orientation that isn't oriented anywhere. Um, And then being aromantic means experiencing little to low levels of romantic attraction. And they're not actually the same thing. A lot of people think that your sexual and romantic orientations have to be the same thing. But I think that nowadays, I know that the bisexual, pansexual community use the split attraction model as well but it's kind of like an understanding that sometimes you might be more sexually attracted to one gender romantically attracted to another and those things don't necessarily line up it just so happens that for me i am asexual and aromantic so i'm just not attracted to anybody but there are some people who might be asexual and still attracted to men or women or non-binary people and or aromantic people that still experience sexual attraction so if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. To clarify for my silly brain, so asexual is sexy stuff, <laughs> lusty things, and romantic is love things, emotional yeah. attachments. Right, got it. So someone can be asexual, but not aromantic. So they want to go out on a date, they want to hold hands, they want to go to the movies, they want to fall in love and be married. Fall and in be, love and cuddle yeah. up, but they do not want to have sex. Yeah. And someone else might be sexual, but aromantic. So they might want to have 
lots of sex with different people or even the same person, but they don't want all the romance and stuff. I remember meeting men like that at university. Um, <laughs> however, that does not mean, that's a joke, that does not mean that person is a romantic. That means that they may have been in a period of their life when romance was not there on their agenda or wasn't their priority. Um, so somebody who is a romantic is somebody who for life, they're just not going to fall in love. It's just not who they are. It's not part of their personality. What a lot of free time. Oh God. What a, what a, rela- what a lot how of re- lovely heart and headspace. Oh my God. Imagine your, imagine your life as a feminist if you just didn't have to, you know, I'm sure there's downsides. Can I ask about the overlooked element of it? I just think there's such scepticism around it. Do you know what I mean? I, 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 I'm pansexual slash bisexual slash liable to fancy anyone because... I find it too complicated to pick a labelling. And um, I know that historically there's been a lot of like denial of that, in- invisibility for that community. But that, that must be, I'm assuming, a hundredfold for asexuality. Because I think people go, whatever, it's a phase, a hundred times more for that than they do for other queernesses. Would that be right? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a kind of universal erasure, invisibility issue, particularly, well, I mean, I think a lot of people, they're not even on the whole romantic orientation thing. Like, we're not even there yet as a conversation. So Mm -hmm. that one is, that one's just kind of like out the window. But I think for asexuality now, it's kind of a thing where people are kind of aware of it, but then they're like, but I don't really think it's a thing. Like, it's more a subject of debate just because there's just that amount of awareness, but just about enough for people to form a misguided opinion of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you want misguided opinions, welcome to 2021. Um, (laughs) uh, Can I ask, is it rude to ask any questions? Because I want to ask on behalf of the listeners and obviously on behalf of myself, are there any questions I shouldn't ask? Um, No, you can go for it. (laughs) Okay, great. All right. So does an asexual person ever masturbate? Yep. I mean, I I haven't done a survey on everybody, but I could say through personal experience, yes. And I can say that it's, I mean, as I say, the sexual orientation isn't oriented anywhere, but it's not a physical thing. It's not like you have like a a hormone imbalance or it's like something you can take medication to increase. So it doesn't really affect your physical Mess, if that makes sense. So you don't look at George Clooney or, you know, the lead guy from Bridgerton and go, cool, or also look at Ruby Rose or, you know, Helen Mirren, or I don't know why. I'm just picking people. I'm loving this, this day. I'm I really love this, loving this you. group of people. Pluck it, plucking hotties from the air. Yeah. It's quite a diverse batch you've got there. Gillian Age Anderson. Rain. Do you look at, do you, yeah. if you look at Gillian Anderson. That's the barometer, is it? Yeah. <laughs> The ultimate is. Well, I'm trying to. I'm really. I'm trying to. I understand. find they're like, good-looking people, but like, okay, yeah. this way, they're good-looking people, but I, I'm not tempted to sit on their faces. Is that? This is, is that helpful. Helps? Okay. So, <laughs> say for example, I feel so embarrassed asking these questions, and I'm not asking about you. I'm asking about the asexual population as, and I know it's not a monolithic group. I feel like I'm asking you to talk about it like a monolithic group, but. I think it's what people wonder, and I think like understanding it is going to help be really helpful. Also, you've written so beautifully about it. I've stalked your Instagram. <laughs> oh, thank lo- you. Loads. <laughs> is it if you were to masturbate? If it's not oriented anywhere, where's the driver coming from? There, do you see what I mean? I mean, oh, it's kind of hard to talk for every because of course there are some asexual people who do still have sex. I know an asexual couple who are they're both men. They're both married. They're both totally into like BDSM and they are both sexual, just not actually touching each other. So, oh. I mean, and sexual people, if you if you have a partner, you might, you know, maybe you'll think about them, but you won't, but not, okay. you know, because okay. there are kind of, there are some asexual people who do still feel some degree of, of sexual attraction, but whether it, it will actually translate into things happening, kind of a different story or Mm. I wrote some articles on it before and almost everybody that I spoke to said that they might be able to picture stuff but it can't relate to them they could think about sexuality or pleasure or or anything like that but if they think about having sex themselves that's not the thing right it it has to there has to be like a disassociation between anything happening with them because it's not 
like you're not fantasizing about being with people. So, okay. So that makes sense to me. In terms of the a romanticism, is it something where you're, you have uh, friendships and other relationships that become tentpole relationships in your life? So I sometimes think our female friendships that are not sexual are more important to us than our romantic lives sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Like, Jess, I don't know if this is true for you. It certainly is complicated. Like you might have really one intense ones. best friend from school that goes mm-hmm. through your whole life with you, but you might have any number of romantic partners in that time. Yes, absolutely. I've got two groups of women, one I've known since primary school and one since university. I'm at, I can't imagine not being friends with them at any point. I think we'll be old together. I think we'll, yeah. And almost no matter what happens with romantic partners. Already some of the tests have been... Some of the things some of those friends have been through and the way people's lives have changed and, you know, it's incredibly enduring. But also, I think, well, then you get into the realms of what philosophically we expect from different relationships. And actually, like, it's quite new, isn't it, in um, in terms of the grand scheme of history that we expect our sexual and romantic relationships to also be friendships, essentially, to be long lasting. Like, marriage is invented for politics and breeding Mm -hmm. and economics like it's only really recently in terms of human history that people have gone no I want to marry for love and sexual attraction and then expecting that to last in the same way as a friendship it's incredible and I feel like it once you what I remember I first learned that wasn't that long ago it's like an Alandu Botan thing and I was like whoa and then I was like oh well then a lot of alternative um, ways of having relationships, especially in terms of very, very long relationships, made a lot more sense to me, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, Yasmin, it's sort of, I think there are models in our lives if we are, because asexual people and aromantic people are overlooked so much, we have to educate ourselves about it. And there are models in our lives for that, whether we are romantic or sexual or not, I think. Uh, Not fashion models, examples, she means, Yasmin. (laughs) Sorry, not alternative fashion models. You're the model in our life in both senses, and thank you. Yes, you are are modelling incredibly. What else is it that you would like us to know about asexuality and aromanticism? Um, I mean, it's kind of different for both, I think, for aromanticism. I think it's kind of important for people to remember that the contemporary concept of romance is actually kind of a recent thing, as you mentioned, with like the concept of marriage and what it originally meant. And it is a socialized thing and it is a personal thing. I'm sure if you were to ask each person how they define love or look at different romantic relationships, they'll probably all manifest. There'll be some things that people do just because they're taught you're meant to do it, like hold hands or sleep in the same bed or all those things. But then I think Mm -hmm. in other ways, you'll probably notice that they manifest in very different ways and people have very different definitions of what is their romantic normal or what they would look for. Or you might look at something, I think that doesn't really seem like love to me, but okay. It's a very like subjective thing, but because people kind of treat it as if it is like a universal factual truth, therefore they think that people who are aromantic or just aren't kind of tuned into that truth are missing something essential or are psychologically lacking or are spiritually lacking, or they have some kind of like serious mental or personality flaw. So yeah, that's something I think people should think about when it comes to that. And then for asexuality as well, I think I think that our discussions of sexuality are definitely more nuanced nowadays, but I think that within that nuance and within our like increased discussions of sexuality, I think sometimes we kind of lean into a, you either like this or you like this, and that's kind of it. And there's no, well, what if you're actually not into any of those things? And kind of being able to teach people that that's like normal as well. And that like sexual liberation isn't just having sex with as many people as possible or expressing your sexuality in a specific way, like an absence of sexuality Mm -hmm. is also a type of sexuality. And that's actually a valid, normal thing. And that isn't a symptom of some kind of like deep issue or it's not necessarily like a kind of anti-sex societal countercultural statement. Mm. Oh, I think a lot of people think a thing that will go away when you meet the right person. Like, I think that's a lot of like, 
I don't know. Gen- what's the generation older than my one? Baby boomers? That's a- generation X? You're yeah, Y, aren't I, you? Are you, are you you're, I'm millennial. You're millennial, yeah, you're Y. All right. I said it as if I was really proud. I think I might be. It's only because I so recently learned that I was one, and it makes so much sense. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like, like, like you said, like it's a star it's like sign. It's a, it's a value sign. I know, like, like it's, Virgo, pre, and like it's so genuinely much predestined stuff. Like, I don't own my home. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I've worked really hard. I've never been, I've never not had a job. I, I still don't own my home. That's I'm looking at 40. Yeah. Um, so no, love an avocado, but don't buy them. Like the planet more. Anyway, I'm doing some stereotyping for comedy. If you've given up avocados, you should be able to afford your own home. We, we've covered that. It's yeah. avocado toast that <laughs> stops people buying houses. Um, yeah, I think it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And it makes complete sense when you talk about it the way you do. Yes, ma'am. But it's just one of those things where I think it just takes time, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. I've really been affected by what you just said there, Yasmin. You've basically said your whole romantic vision and therefore relationship is a construct, which I sort of knew, but I think you've said it in a way that's made me go oh, I need to reassess everything. Because things like sleeping in the same bed, it's just what you've seen on the TV. Or, you know, you've got to, as you say, Jessica, you know, love somebody who you also fancy, who's so going to be your best friend and you've got to make it last forever, otherwise you're a failure. All of these, it's such a construct that's been imposed upon us. We know shit's getting deep if you're calling me Jessica. Yeah, so it's all, it's like all the things that you said about people don't necessarily want to hold hands, but they've seen it in a movie and that's what love is. So you're looking forward to holding hands with someone for the first time. You're looking forward to being someone kissing you for the first time. You're looking forward to all those things because you've been told to look forward to them. And then if you think, oh, I don't really like this person's tongue in my mouth. You're like, you do. You do because you've seen it in the movies. You love it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it till you learn to like it. We, it is oh. funny, isn't it? That that's what oh, we I do. Oh, I got real like ooh, shudder <laughs> off the idea of having to be forced to keep trying it. Yeah, we kind of do. I think it's, it's really it's interesting the when you say that though, because like I literally grew up almost feeling scared of those things because I didn't want to do them, but also it was one of those things where it was like you had to do them by a certain age as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I kind of went through secondary school being absolutely terrified that I had to do something I didn't want to do. But yeah, it took me forever to actually realize that I was asexual. It wasn't until I was about nearly 19 and I was at university and one of my friends was kind of grilling me about it. And he ended up kind of comparing me to Sherlock a bit in the BBC series. Mm. And gosh, you must be very it kind young. of made sense at the time, but I didn't enjoy being compared to a sociopath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is often the comparisons we get, to be honest, because most characters who are asexual or romantic are sociopaths. So <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> yeah, usually. It's kind of like the whole Voldemort kind of vibe. Or they're um, robots, Star Trek, kind of like data, alien energy. Mm-hmm. So there is, that's so interesting that there aren't any depictions. We need more depictions on screen of warm, uh, creative, collaborative, open people who are asexual and aromantic that are positive because we just don't see it. What percentage of our population is asexual, do you think, as Jess says, now it's safer to come out? It's hard to kind of deter. There's been some research into it. I think the general current consensus is about 1%, which sounds small, but then about like 1% of the population are ginger, and most people know a ginger person. So it sounds small, but it's kind of like not exceptionally small. But then I also feel like that's probably an underrepresentation because that depends on people knowing what asexuality is in order to identify with it. Mm. And I think that's obviously going to kind of impact that number. I mean, mm. there's been some studies that said that asexual men don't exist. I'm like, I know so many that like, mm, yeah. I, I have that's, more that's... asexual guy friends and girlfriends. So that's, yeah. that they definitely exist. They probably just weren't in your research sample. That's toxic masculinity. A hundred percent. Like in the same way, every woman I know who's had straight romantic relationships. So with men has experienced our relationship at some point with a man who was like 
just not really very interested in sex, but the stigma around it for a guy mm. is in no- is so enormous that oh, it's, it's devastating, really, because then you've got this situation where the woman's like, "What the hell is wrong with mm. me?" If they're not interested, because men want to be like men, are be obsessed, and whereas they, oh, I mean. From some people's experience, seem to be like, well, I'm not. I can't, how could I possibly deal with this? Like, I'm shutting down about it, complete denial, etc., mm. etc. Cetera, et cetera, because it, I think it's catastrophic. I think that it is um, one of the most glaring examples of of toxic masculinity: the horror of when a when a guy has to deal with some asexuality. Because they're meant to be the pursuer, and whereas women need to be defending their honour, and there's all sorts of narratives in that about asexuality for women. I was writing something recently with a couple in it where a man and a woman and in this fictional couple and the guy is completely not interested in sex Mm -hmm. and um, a person in the industry reading that, a very high up person read that and was like, oh, hang on, what? The bloke's gone off sex. (laughs) The bloke's not interested in sex. I was like, yeah. What? Like, I can't believe I'm having to have this conversation. <laughs> like, it's so much more common. Times of all of my yeah. girlfriends. You know, what I was saying before about women often analysing things. The conversation over the years has been so much more frequently. My husband's gone off sex, and I don't know why. Or, you know, he's never interested, or he's too tired, or it's so much more than with my male friends complaining that their girlfriend or wife doesn't want to have sex. So much more. And also, isn't that more interesting for a script than what we've seen a million times before, which is a man mm. trying to get a woman to have sex? Mm-hmm. It's hoping. This is so fascinating. So yeah. fascinating, Yasmin. And Zozi. It's amazing to hear your, your take So on it helpful all. to hear. I was just going to say that, actually. Um, Zozi, I'm really... Grateful you chipped in. It sounds like I, I wasn't out of copying Jess Foster Q, but I just wanted to know you to know that I also appreciate you. I don't want you to feel like, yeah. Um, Zosie, right. I just want you to know that I probably do appreciate you a little bit more, though, because I did say it first. Yeah, it's, so. it's true, Jess appreciates you a little just, bit more. Can we just acknowledge that yeah. I did say it first? And <laughs> I backed you up like a backing singer. So we both yeah. appreciate you, Zosie. Um, me a bit more. <laughs> yes. So Yasmin, <laughs> what else oh do we need to know about this in terms of what can we do to raise awareness and or what else is our role here? Well, I mean, well, things like this are, are, are helpful in the sense of like using your platform to kind of, you know, spread awareness or amplify asexual voices and all that kind of stuff. That's definitely helpful. I also think that there are just things people can just do like in their everyday lives, like if you're having a conversation with someone and you're talking about sexuality and you're talking about different kinds of sexualities, like throw away sexuality in there. Or if you're talking about like, you know, sexual attraction or romantic attraction, you could be like, oh, you know that they don't necessarily like entirely line up or, hey, that could maybe you're aromantic or on the aromantic spectrum or asexual spectrum or just in your discussions about sexuality, don't kind of treat it as like a kind of, you have to be doing this, this, or this. Just kind of expand it a bit more in a way that's more inclusive asexuality. And if you do it in like a casual way, then it just kind of like normalizes it. And then maybe the person hearing that will be like, oh, that was an interesting point. Maybe I'll, and then they might mention that to someone else when they're having a conversation about sexuality or when they hear something online and then, you know, then it's kind of like a butterfly effect. And before you know it, everybody's doing it. So I think that there are some things you can do like on in a kind of media way, but then also things you can just kind of do in your personal life that I think will have a very good knock on effect. And my head is just running with times where I think I've fucked up, where I think a friend has been talking to me about their asexuality and I think I've fucked up. Actually, I've learned loads from this and I'm very grateful. I also am thinking about a man who I still to this day think, I think he was gay, but actually I think maybe he is he's asexual. I think I've imposed gayness on him because of set of set of circumstances. Sort of understandably and sort of probably not. I think he's asexual. I'm just realizing it now and I'm going oh, I mean no. people tend to go for gay first. Like a lot of people thought I was gay for ages. Yeah, so... people thought that about me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Literally throughout secondary school because I wasn't as interested in forming those kinds of relationships. There was a lot of stuff going around school being like, oh, I think Zoe's gay. And it always bothered me that they saw that as a bad thing. 
And I was just like, well, even if I am, that shouldn't be an issue anyway. But yeah, there was a lot of thinking I was gay before I actually realised that actually I'm not that interested in anyone. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, I went to an old girls school and people thought I was gay. And I was like, if I was gay, you'd know about it by now. This is the perfect place to be gay. Everybody here is a little gay at the moment. So if I was gay, I wouldn't be a secret. Come on. <laughs> That is that's fascinating. I, I mean, I was so, I was such a Peter Pan, speaking of Peter Pan at school. Um, I was nowhere near ready, nowhere near ready. But my school, there was no great expectation that I would be, that that not everyone was doing it by any means. I just hung out with my group of friends. And then because my family got involved in a cult-like religion, I wasn't really allowed to and no one was really interested in me. So I got quite screwed up by that. But as it turns out later in life, Although I was a late starter, once I got going, I'm I'm I I'm not I'm not asexual and not aromantic. But had I been, I think that would have become confused up with it. And I'm now also thinking of the women around the world and mm. through history where husbands are imposed upon them who are asexual mm. and aromantic. And that must be awful. It must be really, really the worst thing. And if if one in a hundred women are asexual and they are forced into, you know, historically have been forced into marriages. That must be terrible, really, really terrible. Uh, so we need to think about it. And there are still parts of the world where girls are, you know, expected to get married pretty much no matter what. Yeah, it's not uncommon even in, I mean, even if you have some awareness of asexuality, people kind of think it's that kind of the mentality of you'll find the right person and that'll just mm -hmm. cure it. Mm -hmm. So I know lots of asexual people that have kind of either being forced into situations or forced themselves into situations because mm -hmm. they've been told, well, this will fix it. So you need to do that and you can train yourself out of it. And if they're aromantic, they end up in relationships or they're asexual, they end up in sexual relationships because they think it's like corrective. Mm -hmm. so that's still an unfortunately common thing. Or they're just given a bunch of pills that also don't make a difference. I, no, I mean, thanks. I say parts of the world. Why do I think this isn't happening in the West the whole time when we're enforcing it upon ourselves? We're forcing it on, you know, parents saying to their kids, come on, when are you going to get married? When am I going to have grandchildren? All of that is still going on. I bet there's millions of asexual people in unhappy relationships who just think, mm. I guess I don't like this very much and I have to put up with it or I'm with the wrong person and they don't realise there is no person that would make them happy or no sexual situation with another human being that would make them happy. The more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm going, oh my God, this must be everywhere. And it's actually important we talk about it. So if somebody is asexual, they feel like, oh, I'm asexual, that's what it is. And honestly, if I, I think if I were asexual, how much of my life I would have reclaimed in a way, not wondering if someone fancies me. Like, it's a lot of work and effort thinking about whether people fancy you or how you can be more fanciable. It is. When people say, oh, do you feel like you're missing out? I'm like, honestly, no. I feel like I have a lot of free time. Mm, I feel like I'm lives. not basing my self-worth on how much other people think I'm screwable. <laughs> so mm. I think that I, I, I don't really feel like I'm, I, I feel like I'm quite, good at basing my own value on how I perceive myself instead of being one of those people that feels like they're an incomplete, unlovable person if they're single mm. or if no one's having sex with them. So mm. I like in that sense, I think it's a psychologically helpful, I think, for me. Oh, anyway. my God. So much sex. So. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's like a next level of evolution, frankly. <laughs> it really is, isn't it? It's like, yes, I almost wonder, like, it's just a terrible thought. It's just like it's just like an epiphany to me that part of me just went, well, what did you do with your twenties? Like, what? I mean, you... I'm only four years into it, but um... I mean, yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I mean, but, I mean, sort of what? Sorry, I didn't impl mean to imply you're 45. I'm just like, what, what? I mean, and I know that Zosie, you're very young because you said that when you were awakening up to your asexuality, Sherlock was on the telly. So obviously, you're very young, but. Um, uh, as opposed to I dream of genie. But I think my thought patterns are what's the full time job you've got in your 20s, guessing whether people fancy you and trying to get them to fancy you or trying to get them to say if they do fancy you because no one wants to say because no one wants to be vulnerable. It feels like, oh, my God, there's a whole job you don't have that feels sort of like a weight off, but also like, <gasps> what would I fill that void with? It is a burden when I think about it. Yeah, I, mean, I think it kind of depends on your 
because like from like I'm one of those people that feels like okay this is something I don't have to worry about so I could just focus on a whole bunch of other constructive things but then there are unfortunately because of the way like like we're socialized there are a lot of asexual people that will then spend like instead of having that kind of void that they can fill with other things they're thinking oh my god I have a void I am missing this huge thing. What is wrong mm. with me? I'm never going to have this amazing thing that everyone else says is so incredible, even though it's stressing them the hell out. So it kind of depends on how you kind of deal with it. But I mean, for me, it meant I was really wasn't very distracted during uni. So that was good. That is good. I guess it kind of just depends on your mindset and how you've kind of handled things. I sort of have a bridge into that because I don't have children and I've never really had the sort of got to have children thing, did try, didn't work out. And occasionally I will have a twinge. If things aren't going well in my career or something, suddenly I'll have this twinge of, have I missed out on one of life's big experiences and now I'll never have it, now I'll never have anything. But most of the time I don't want it. Is that a useful parallel? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, of course, there are times where I think what maybe in like, I don't know, 10 years time, if all my friends are married or something, and everyone's kind of like living that life, and I've moved out, and I'm not around my family so much, maybe then I'll be kind of like, uh, okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> I can see the appeal in this right now. Mm-hmm. But then it's kind of like, I know, but then I would have to be forcing myself into doing something that isn't natural. But then I feel like, there are a lot of asexual and romantic people. There are other kind of unconventional types of relationships and families that don't fit into the typical romantic nuclear vibe. I mean, we, we call them queer platonic kind of like relationships or kind of untraditional families. I know somebody who's like a third parent legally in California, because you can do that, to a couple who have a kid and then they're kind of like a, they're not romantically involved with each other. Two of them are, but then they're kind of like a three parent family and makes that's sense. Still less makes his sense. kid and there are different ways you can kind of do things so I feel like hopefully in about what 10 years time him, mate. I wish they'd <laughs> sort that out here <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know it does make sense because we did w- nuclear family is very new as well it was usually you know it used to be a child was raised by a village and now it's raised by two people trapped in a house in a pandemic or <laughs> one or one and uh, yeah. that's uh, obviously a tougher ask is there anything you came to say Yasmin that you didn't get to say that you'd like to say um, I th- I feel like I said it. I think we're I think we're good. <laughs> well, you have been the most fascinating guest. I feel I've learned a lot. I feel like I've woken up. I've had loads of epiphanies, and I'm like, oh, oh. And you've also made me question my own paradigm. Tom Solinsky is producing this podcast. It may be that our relationship's not going to last till Friday. To be honest with you, Tom. <laughs> I've suddenly realised I've just been seduced by movies. No, I love him. <laughs> I, I I love him, and and we've got a flat. You, where am I going to get a flat in a pandemic? Um, unless I move in with Jess and become a third parent. I love causing a paradigm shift on a podcast. You really have. You really have for me. I'm not making that up. You have. If people want to know and hear more from you, read more from you, where can they follow you? Oh, I'm pretty active on Instagram at the Yasmin Benoit. So T-H-E-Y-A-S-M-I-N-B-N-O-I-T. It's the same on Twitter. Kind of, If you just Google me, all my socials will come up and articles and stuff will come up. <laughs> Uh, Yasmin Benoit, you have been a wonderful, wonderful guest and we really appreciate you. Thanks so much for having me. Our musician today, I believe to be part of the Elfin crew um, (laughs) because they have a pixie-ish quality about them. Their music is absolutely brilliant. They are also an activist for asexuality and non binariness Please welcome to the microphone the incredible Zozi. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So, Zozi, can you tell us a little bit about what song you're going to sing? Uh, so this song is one of my own songs. I kind of unintentionally made an EP throughout lockdown. Oh, I accidentally um, made an EP this morning. <laughs> Just what's just what lockdown does to you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All that spare time. <laughs> I didn't. But I didn't. yeah, I'm um, impressed. I guess you can kind of get a journey with it because there were a couple of songs on there that were written before we went into lockdown, and then a couple of the others that are on there were during lockdown, and the most recent one in November as well. So you kind of get a gist of the journey that you went through, but. The song that I'm performing tonight is Whispers 
And I guess that's, it's the most popular track on the EP, but it's focusing on just looking inwards at yourself and actually giving yourself permission to heal from things and to start moving on to the next chapter, I Oof. guess. We all need that right um, now. Yeah. Anthem yeah. <laughs> for 2021. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, 2020 was a bit of a blessing and a curse for me personally because it kind of forced me to admit to myself that I needed a bit of help unpicking a few things that I'd been through. And as a result of that, I've come out of 2020 being a much healthier person, I guess, and kind of beginning to give myself the permission to take up space in a conversation as well. And just having the confidence to live. (laughs) So yeah, it's quite a deep and personal song, but I think it can be applied to a lot of situations because it's quite simple lyrically, but yeah. Well, take it away, Zosie.
Woo! Woo! That was fantastic. Woo! That was awesome. Beautiful. So, Zee, where can we hear Woo! that track and more of your music, please? Uh, the EP and that song in particular is available on Bandcamp where you can stream it for free or you can buy it and download it. Um, I think the starting price is £7 on Bandcamp. But the good thing about Bandcamp is it gives you an idea of what your starting price could be. And then you have the option to pay more if you think it's worth more. Um, so it's really good for market research and all of that jazz. So if you <laughs> um, if you want to support artists and uh, then go to Bandcamp, if you wanted to yeah. if you want to support Zozi, and why wouldn't you? And buy that beautiful song, and maybe buy some other songs while you're there uh, from her. Then check out Bandcamp, and uh, if you've got no money at all, you can stream them. But if you've got seven quid, I know that Zozie would really appreciate it because artists can't play live and tour at the moment. No, it's such a pain. It is a pain. But once you're... Such a nice way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a disaster. But once we're back out and live, we'll come and see you on tour. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that would be really exciting. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis, white guest co-host Jessica Fostergu and our very special guest, Yasmin Benoit, with music from Zozi. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Sheldon. The producer was Tom Salitsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Rachel Croft, Virginia Dizio and everyone who made this episode happen, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com! Woo! Totally unconsensual conversation. Cut all of this out, Tom. It's embarrassing. I can't. Yeah. I'm going to get cancelled. I'm going to get cancelled for this conversation. All of it. I'm going to get cancelled. <laughs> to be honest, though, I could do with the rest. I'd be all right to be cancelled. <laughs> I'd be all right to be cancelled for six months. Six months to six to eight months, I'd be delighted to be cancelled at the moment. <laughs> You're so cutting that out. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm just saying. Oh, dear. I'm just saying.